to the podcast Byzantium and Friends, a podcast where the old becomes new and the new turns out to be much older than you thought. <laughs> I'm Anthony, your host. Do you know what we need to study more? Emperors. <laughs> no, no, no. So hear me out. I, I don't mean traditional biographies or those psychological assessments, you know, where the, you end up by saying, well, here are the things he did well and here are the things. Um, no. What we really still need to understand is how the imperial office worked, like in practice, in the nitty gritty, in the mechanisms of consultation and deliberation and decision making and all the different constituencies sort of embedded in a thick account of the political and socioeconomic challenges that emperors faced. You can't really find such a study, which is a bit weird, seeing as emperors are like really the most well-documented individuals slash institution um, in, in the Byzantine Empire. The picture is much better in the early Byzantine period, aka late antiquity. So there, this has been studied much, much more. But the later you go, the less you find that kind of analysis. Why is that? Well, in my view, there are a number of historiographical traditions that have blocked our engagement with that nitty-gritty world of decision-making. One of them is um, an overemphasis on theological theorizations of the imperial position. And so, so and this is kind of routine in Byzantine studies when many historians start to talk about the emperor, it immediately becomes sort of very abstract, theological, you know, the emperor and God and all of that. Um, there's a lot of discussion of imperial orations which stress virtues, um, or if you're attacking an emperor, vices, which again is a very sort of personalized um, moralizing approach and uh, doesn't engage with the mechanics of government. So there's nothing like a political science in there. Now, on the other hand, we do have very many studies that focus on institutions, the institutions of taxation, of the military, of the legal system, uh, of you name it, the administration of the church. And these are generally studied as sort of impersonal institutions with offices and structures and hierarchies that continue over time. They're relatively stable for you know, a medieval state. And yet, when you follow those hierarchies from their sort of feet in the provinces all the way up to the capital in Constantinople, then there's this gap. And we have a problem in interfacing how those relatively impersonal institutions operate with the what is presented to us as very personalized a uh, power of the individual emperor of the time. So there's a there's a kind of conceptual gap there and it's very difficult to make those two parts work, especially since as I mentioned the emperor is generally theorized in very either theological or personalized moralizing readings. And so what generally gets lost in that gap is precisely all the, the politicking and the lobbying and the, the operations of the court on a day-to-day -day basis. It, it's sort of indicative in this regard that we have very, very few books on the Byzantine court. Like there's an edited volume, there's something in Italian, and that's kind of it. If you tried to find, you know, close studies of how the political system works, kind of embedded in the physical court in Constantinople, you can't. It's not that the sources don't exist, it's that the theoretical models for it don't exist. And also because the evidence has to be drawn from a wide variety of sources, and it needs to be embedded into some kind of model that bridges the gap that I mentioned earlier. So how did emperors make decisions? So here to talk to us about that is uh, Professor Michael Grunbart, uh, who is um, at the University of Münster in Germany. And he hasn't yet written like the book on this, but he is involved in a project that is trying to, you know, penetrate into that uh, the black box of imperial decision making, um, and is here to talk to us about some of the sort of preliminary thoughts that he has about how that process worked. 
he is a scholar who has published widely on many, many aspects of mostly Middle Byzantine history and culture, um, especially like if you could find a theme behind the many different things that he's done, it's communication. Uh, so epistolography, but also imperial protocols, seals, this sort of thing, um, but many other topics as well. Uh, but they do seem to sort of coalesce around this uh, issue of imperial decision making uh, because it was something that was situated right between, you know, receiving information from the provinces, from the bureaus, from your legal and ecclesiastical and military officials, and then sort of processing that information. And then it results in some sort of communication, whether a an official decision or a rhetorical act or, or doing nothing, which is always an option. Uh, so we're going to be talking about some of the aspects of that decision-making process, uh, like, you know, when do you delegate? Um, how do you change your mind if you've made this? <laughs> how are these decisions evaluated? Um, who do you consult? Uh, who do you make a show of consulting even if you've already made up your mind? Um, things like that. There, there, there's really a lot of room for viewing emperors just as kind of managers, um, not just political leaders, but also as political leaders who are very, very sensitive to individual constituencies and the change, the fluctuations in public opinion and things like that, which make them far more worldly and sort of earthly characters than the panegyrical orations or the theological disputations uh, would lead you to think which, of course, was the point of all of those <laughs> disputations and orations and so forth. Okay, a couple of notes. Uh, the uh, Thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting this podcast. At one point, uh, Michael reads from a translation of Psalos' chronographia. The, uh, I think it's from the Penguin uh, translation uh, called 14 Byzantine Rulers, which I, I recommend until we have a, a better, more up-to-date translation of that text. Uh, so without any further delay, here is my conversation with Michael Grumbart about uh, imperial decision making. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Good afternoon. So I'm really happy that you proposed this topic for our discussion because I feel that we're still groping about in the dark when it comes to some of these issues. And so, so here's a little bit of the paradox. One can argue that emperors have received more attention in scholarship than any other person from Byzantium, right? And that, that's true. And many of us are struggling to get away from this, you know, court-centered view and look at the provinces and other groups that are not very well represented in our sources. And yet at the same time, I feel that we still haven't even begun to understand how the court operated, especially in its mechanics, and emperors have been discussed from many, many different points of view, but not necessarily for what they did all day and how they did it. And there's a lot of evidence, but it's so fragmented and scattered that it's going to require a lot of work to pull it together. So it's not an easy topic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've heard the court described as a kind of black hole where we know what kind of inputs went in and we kind of know what kind of outputs came out but we don't exactly know what was going on inside. Uh, so um, th I really wanted to have this discussion because you're someone who's looked at these sources very closely and you know something of the mechanics and the, the, the gears that, that uh, operated inside the court. So let's talk about imperial decision-making and, and how it worked, right? So emperors in theory could make decisions about anything, right? But in practice, not everything. So why don't we start by talking about what sorts of things did emperors usually make decisions about? Uh, you know, the, the top items that filled up their agenda for the day. Um, and, you know, and, and we'll focus on those as we go along in the conversation. Yeah, thank you again for the invitation. So uh, let me uh, say something about the project at the beginning. Uh, this project on imperial decision making in Byzantium emerged from a larger project called Cultures of Decision-Making. And uh, we were interested in 
discussing how decisions have been produced, so to say. So producing mm. uh, decisions. And I choose the Byzantine court. And uh, the Byzantine emperor was in a permanent state of decision-making emergency, so to say. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, uh, a very stressful position. And uh, therefore, uh, strategies of coping with problems had to be developed. And um, it, it is clear that uh, a monarch or solitary ruler cannot decide everything. So the, uh, he needed some uh, uh, tools in order to delegate or to produce uh, decisions that he uh, uh, gives to other persons in uh, at court, for instance. And so uh, if you read the sources, we discover certain patterns of decisions that the, the Byzantine emperor had to make, and this were the most, most important decisions. For instance, uh, war and peace. So these are very important uh, fields of decision-making. When should I go to war? Should I go to war? Or is it better to try to uh, get uh, a peace uh, treaty, for instance? Yeah. So, And in the sources, you normally find uh, um, decision-making process that do not end very well or that false decisions have been made. So this is always a, um, an aspect that has to be kept in mind that normally uh, the good decisions, so to say, or decisions with positive ends, they are not recorded. Mm. Uh, normally wow. decisions that uh, failed or that that's, uh, caused problems are recorded in the sources. So this is a, a principal problem with many aspects of business history. Um, and uh, an interesting aspect is, or have also to keep in mind, that um, the emperor was a lonely decision maker. So it's it's uh, this this loneliness of a decision maker is also an interesting aspect because he is the last person who is responsible for a certain decision. Yeah, um, and, and quite recently, uh, dealing with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I heard the quotation that politicians are, they have do not have a very good job because they have to make lonely decisions because they are the only responsible persons. And this reminds me to the business emperor. So it's, it's very similar to, to uh, the modern period. In it. Uh, yeah. Um, another question is, um, which decisions were important enough to reach the emperor? Uh, uh, and who decided that problems should be addressed to the ruling person, ruling man. Um, and this may also explain the very uh, complicated or very uh, sophisticated organization of courts in Byzantium, because there are a lot of um, persons who are dealing with uh, yeah, uh, gathering information and preparing material for the emperor or for other high officials that uh, can be decided by routine, for instance, or by the handbook. This is also an aspect that we'll talk about handbooks a little bit later because this is a very important aspect of decision making, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and if you put all these things together, you may imagine how complex and demanding decision making for an emperor was in that period, or for a ruler in that period was. Mm -hmm. um, so the most important uh, issues concerning uh, decision were war and peace because the emperor or the ruler uh, was responsible, was the last responsible person uh, to safeguard and protect his subjects and the Ecumeni, so the, so the populated or Christianized world. And um, therefore, um, we can find very nice examples of that process of decision making in martial context. So military mm. treatises and military historians um, provide a lot of nice examples uh, concerning that process. Mm. So you mentioned decisions about war and peace. So we'll, we'll start with those. And so, so the fundamental choice would here be, do I call up my armies and go to war? Mm. Or given the practices of the Byzantine court or what we in sort of a managerial term today might call the best practices, yeah. why just pay them to go away, <laughs> right? And, or, or hire someone else to attack them or something like that. So do I risk battle or do I spend money? I, I, I think it often comes down to that. And I've seen modern um, 
uh, yeah, arguments that basically do a cost benefit analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. going to war with an army of this size costs you this much, plus you have the risk. But spending the money to tell them to go away is usually less than that and probably has less risk. And so we often find that the Byzantine historians themselves, you know, like Procopius and whoever, are constantly blaming the emperors for paying the barbarians to go away. And this is dishonorable and disgraceful <laughs> and so forth. But if you look at them from a managerial standpoint, <laughs> It sometimes makes a lot of financial sense to do that. Like the cost benefit analysis su suggests that. And um, I, so I don't know if you've thought about that or, or you know, want to comment on it. I suspect that Procopius had seen past that a little bit because in the secret history, he, he has this counter argument, which is that if you pay the barbarians to go away, then they'll learn that if they keep attacking, you'll just keep paying them. And so it becomes a cycle, uh, uh, like a vicious yeah. circle. So um, anyway, any, any comments about that kind of uh, conundrum? Mm -hmm. Yes, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, this is uh, um, a problem in decision making, but it uh, touches the problem of resources. So which resources are available for the emperor or the decision maker? Decision maker mm. can also be a static also a, a military man. Um, it's always uh, a matter of calculation. So how many soldiers do I have? How many uh, merchants I can employ and how many resources I have in my my treasury for instance right. and it's 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 a, always a, a, a matter of um, uh, calculating the resources I think and and uh, a good emperor or a good ruler he uh, has efficient officials who always provide the information about these resources I think we cannot prove it uh, totally but I think this is how it worked in Byzantium as well and this morning we had a lecture uh, for a student of mine she's dealing with uh, military camps in Byzantium in the early period early Byzantine period mm. and uh, we also discussed the problem how to organize a military campa a campaign and how many factors were uh, important to keep uh, the soldiers running, so to say. And this is this is a very complex uh, field, and you have to think uh, about a lot of things. It's not just strategy. It's also uh, supplying uh, them with food, water, and also transportation. And and uh, a good uh, strategos or decision maker or emperor, he has to calculate all, all this in. He has to gather all this information and then to calculate his potential to go to war, for instance. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, in many cases, it seems to be better to uh, pay tributes or to to send money to to uh, the enemies or the the opponents of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, and you're exactly right that it depends on how much money you have in the treasury too, because mm -hmm. normally you can't borrow from a bank or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. do you happen to have a lot of cash or do you happen to have a good army at hand? And sometimes the decision is made that way. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing that you mentioned is what are the topics that rise above the threshold of the emperor's attention, right? So what is brought before the emperor to decide? Because a lot of things are probably decided along the way before they reach that level. And I suspect that emperors might have so there, there, there are like two extremes here. So on the one hand, I remember like Diocletian, I think, who is recorded as saying, um, I think it's in Eutropius that like nobody ever tells me anything. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm the least well-informed person in the empire because all his handlers are deciding, you know, what to bring to his attention and whatnot, right? And on the other hand, I can imagine emperors who would want certain kinds of decisions to be made by subordinates sort of lower down the chain so that so that they are free of it, so that they, no taint, if it goes wrong, like they can't be blamed. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that later be, because it, it comes to delegating and so on. Um, and I wanted to talk about another aspect that you brought up, which is uh, like consultation, because you mentioned the lonely decision maker, but clearly emperors either genuinely consulted with various constituencies. And so I'd wanna ask you, so who are those constituencies in each case? And was there also a time when the decision was already made, but that a theater of consultation was sort of deemed appropriate? And, you know, I, I say this from being like a, basically a bureaucrat in a university. I know when my administration is actually looking for <laughs> input. 
And when they have already decided how things are going to happen, but they just want the show of consultation and deliberation and consensus. Yes, uh, so a good ruler has to to uh, to uh, consult um, persons who are expert in various fields, and such recommendations are made in mirrors of princes uh, or uh, parenetic literature. And uh, so he has to rely on 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 three resources, so to say. Uh, at court, he has um, persons who were experts in the field of administration, of military service, for instance, and these were experts who had the experience how to govern and how to organize a campaign, for instance. And the second important resource um, is, and this is also mentioned in in, uh, handbooks and also military treatises, um, to use literature or to use certain handbooks dealing, for instance, with military tactic treatises Mm. or uh, special literature dealing with uh, thunder or, or or lightning and so forth. So a uh, good decision maker or a good ruler, he has also to consult his library, so to say, or his written resources. Mm. And a third group uh, is, um, I call them also experts, um, experts who are dealing, for instance, with uh, natural sciences, with astrology, astronomy, and this uh, various uh, yeah, kinds of special uh, sciences that are also uh, perf- that were also performed in the Byzantine period, um, and these experts they were important uh, when it comes to finding a correct date, for instance, to start an action or something like that. And mm-hmm. you always find all during all centuries you always find persons who are experts in that fields in, in those fields of of uh, sciences and they played an important role at that court. Mm. So do you imagine that an emperor's, the emperor's day, like do you imagine that an emperor is sort of receiving reports from various groups and experts during the course of the day? But so let's talk about the full range of experts that emperors might have had available. I imagine they had military, administrative, fiscal, logistical, legal, Theological, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Ecclesiastical, like, and in addition to astrological, <laughs> meteorological, like, oh, there are all of these books of omens and things like this. Like, that's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so, do you have the sense that an emperor for most of the day is just receiving reports and talking to, you know, various of these groups? Um. No. So uh, one thing is that there has to be a selection of information. And um, if you study uh, court culture, you always find a party, a close party of friends that are connected Mm -hmm. to the emperor. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's an informal group. Uh, Sometimes we uh, can read about this group and sometimes it's also the Senate. Uh, I think the Senate um, is an understudied um, group. um, a group of persons in Byzantium because uh, the Senate had also the function to uh, discuss problems with the emperor. And, and especially from the 12th century, I think it's in Nikitas Huniatis who mentions the emperor who leaves uh, uh, Constantinople and moves to one of his palaces on the Bosporus and there he uh, makes a conference, so to say, with uh, the Senate. And I think this is an inf- informal circle where information uh, or the uh, the members of the senate bring information to the emperor and they discuss about it and then a decision is produced in in that circle and and i think mm-hmm. such informal circles are very important at court and uh, the emperor had uh, to have such uh, persons uh, um, whom he could trust and um, yeah i call them informal circles and and i think this is an important um, um um, a place where you can produce decisions or discuss problems and, and come to a, a solid conclusion. Mm. Right. So the more technical experts would mm. have been brought in by the informal circle, by like top people in the court. It was mm. like, oh, I know someone who, mm-hmm. I have someone who knows about like architecture or mm-hmm. Greek mm-hmm. fire or, you know, these kinds of things or, or theolo- theological. 
doesn't that put the emperor a little bit at the mercy of this group and you know its own constituencies? I imagine that emperors would like to have their own sort of private consultants, right? Yeah, yeah. You're correct. Uh, thanks. And I like the expression technical support. It's, it's very it's nice. Tech support, <laughs> it's, yes. it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a perfect expression, I think. <laughs> and, and this is a problem. And we have also information that uh, emperors sometimes uh, um, try to recalculate things yeah, that uh, have been brought to them. For instance, Manuel I, Cornenos, you know, he's a, uh, he was an emperor who was interested in uh, exact sciences and also their practice. And he also uh, performed such things. And uh, I remember a passage in Nikitos Kuniatis, uh, decision has to be made about uh, a naval excursion to Sicily. And um, uh, they wanted to start, but uh, the emperor didn't trust the calculators. And then he himself recalculated uh, the correct date. And, and here he's the process. The, the, the emperor does not trust his experts. Mm. He does it on his own. It's a very interesting uh, aspect. And, and um, this is exactly that the process you've mentioned that the emperor cannot trust everyone. And uh, uh, the good emperor has also the ability to control and recalculate things. And, and uh, it's a very nice example. And, and it shows exactly that problem. Because in, uh, especially in the historiographers, in, in Michael Psellos, for instance, uh, and also Nikitas Goniatis or uh, Anna Komine, uh, there's normally uh, a very, uh, uh, there are very cri critical statements about such experts because they might influence an emperor um, to do not correct things, so mm. to say. And, and, and uh, this is always a point of print, although they uh, um, describe such practices in, in great detail in, in historiography, especially reading Michael Psellos at the moment, his 14 Byzantine rulers, um, and uh, it's full of such elements uh, reflecting that form of uh, decision making. Yeah, and I remember many cases where an emperor will put forward a new sort of theological position or church policy that in the end, in the long run, turns out to have been the wrong choice and mm. he's sort of condemned for it. And very often the narratives will say, well, he was influenced by this devious, you know, person, a wizard or someone who was hanging around at the court and descends. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he poured poison into the ears of the emperor. Um, Okay, let's uh, talk about another topic, which is um, sort of fairly interesting. I don't know how much data we have about this. So to what degree were imperial decisions driven by data, like numbers, like accurate reporting of things? Um, I imagine this was definitely the case in military and fiscal matters. But what about other, like the more... Uh, sort of the softer areas of social policy, you know, maybe laws or economics or, you know, things having to do with, um, I don't know, all of the things that Roman law regulates, like inheritances and the, the military lands in the middle of Byzantine period, and like all of those kinds of things where emperors are making decisions in policy, do they have data? Yeah, uh, this is a big problem because we do not have archives. And uh, I think uh, we have some uh, references to archives in Constantinople, for instance, fiscal and, and uh, juridical archives. Um, sometimes they are destroyed by fire, for instance. Mm. And normally the high officials kept their archives or also stated, so to say, archives at home. And uh, there was a lot of data, I think, in such households, but they all vanished and we cannot verify it. Uh, but um, I think, and I, I come back to astronomy and astrology because uh, uh, those sciences uh, are based on numbers. And mm. uh, the interesting and fascinating thing for emperors and uh, military men is that uh, you can um, calculate uh, the dimension or the, the, the distances of stars and then you can calculate them. You have your handbooks and you uh, get a um, numeric result. You get numbers from, from that and then you can uh, produce a decision by those numbers. And 
So reading the stars, you get uh, numbers and those numbers or that calculations you can combine uh, with the problem you have at the moment. And this is uh, evident, for instance, in uh, finding a correct uh, starting point to uh, make an action, for instance. And, and this is a, um, right. a procedure where numbers are very important. Right, um, like the, the date on which you do something. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, yes. this is the only, only uh, area of... Um, uh, decision making connected to to uh, numbers because as i've mentioned before we do not have archives and but archives existed there were fiscal archives and also military archives and i think in, in those archives a lot of records about um, numbers of persons and uh, also the extension of fields for instance have been recorded so. yeah yeah this is a dilemma that i sometimes yeah. face in my thinking because so if you look at the laws mm -hmm. Emperors rarely, if ever, give data and numbers that justify the decisions that they're making in the laws. Their justifications are usually moral mm -hmm. and sometimes supported by anecdotes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they'll be saying like, well, we don't want the powerful to be buying up the lands of the weak. And here's an example that I came across <laughs> when I was traveling in Asia Minor. And it's just like one example. And I think, well, okay, but how big a social problem was this? Because maybe you found an, a, an example and you were really outraged by it because of the injustice and you thought, ah, we really have to fix this problem, but it's not, like five, 10 cases maybe happening everywhere. Or is it the case, like with modern politicians, even when they have the data, they find that their policy um, decisions are more convincing to the general public if they cast them with anecdotes and like people who suffered, you know, from this problem that I'm trying to fix because like they think that the public wants to hear it that way or will um, uh, agree with them if they cast it that way. So I'm never sure, you know, whether that anecdotal justification is for like PR reasons or it's actually why they're making the decision. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if that can be answered. I want to pick up on another thing that you mentioned, which was the advice literature. Uh, so you've mentioned it a couple of times, um, mm -hmm. mirrors of princes, paranetic. Paranetic means like hortatory, like exhorting the emperor, yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, and some you know, technical manuals like astrological and so on. So what is the thrust of these texts, especially the, the moral ones that are giving like advice to the emperor on how to be a good emperor? What is it in general that they want the emperors to do or not to do? So uh, advice literature is also a, in a large field and so we have some manuals from the business period, so military manuals, but uh, a nice text is for instance, uh, Kek of Manos. He's also an important uh, piece of advice literature. Um, Kekav Menos, Kekav Menos was a person who had experiences in the administrative and military system of the empire, and he left a text for his heirs. Um, and he gives practical advices. Uh, so he admonishes them to be careful when, for instance, crossing a bridge and don't eat mushrooms. <laughs> and he, he inserts a lot of uh, nice anecdotes and he tries to yeah to educate them and and i think this is a technique how to instruct uh, the next generation about problems he had in in, in his career um, and he also yeah he presents a lot of um, military examples um, uh, how to be careful and he talks about lists and and uh, intrigues and it's it's a very nice text but uh, i think the intention is also to give um, next generation uh, a manual of how to yeah to think about all options and also to learn by reading uh, the results of these actions that he mentions and uh, to find uh, solutions for uh, problems of the next generation so it's it's a very nice instructive text and um, one of the most important sources are the tactica because in tactica there is sometimes a very theoretical reflection about decision making and um, again um, uh, it is said in I think it's in uh, Tactica Leonis um, that uh, the strategos or the, the, the military commander 
should also consult his best officers and they should meet and then they should discuss uh, options and then there should be a democratic vote. Yeah? So, and, and uh, the uh, commander should then decide uh, if that vote is correct or uh, if they uh, voted for the right solution in his sense, and then he should keep this uh, decision um, in his own mind and wait for the correct uh, mm. uh, date to present it to his army or to, to, uh, uh, yeah, to the army. Hmm? So um, there's a very concrete uh, instruction in, in such uh, manuals sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. So were there circumstances where it was <clears throat> advantageous for the emperor to sort of publicly not be making a decision in other, or to leave the decision to factors beyond his control, like saying, well, this is God's will and, and, and so on. Und mm. Under what circumstances would they do that? So the best example is Justinian, the Nicaraot, you remember, 532. Yes. And, and there's a nice, or for if you're interested in decision-making processes, there's a nice uh, uh, scene. Um, uh, the Hippodrome is full of uh, shouting people and, and there's a lot of uh, yeah, noise. And um, the emperor Justinian, uh, he has no choice to, to um, regulate that, that um, uh, that uh, problem and um, he takes the Bible and tries to convince the people to stop uh, the riot by showing them the Bible and, and he went into the Hippodrome but it was impossible and, and he failed so he had to hide himself again in the palace and this is a, um, a failing emperor in the best sense so mm. his authority did not did not end uh, that riot and it's a, it's a very nice section in in, in procopius and and uh, you can study yeah the problems uh, of losing authority and and uh, losing uh, uh, command mm. yeah and i can also imagine circumstances where either option is bad like an emperor is faced with a choice and they're both bad um, and will probably reap political, you know, blame for it. And it's probably best to just, you know, let things take their course and let God decide. And emperors are very often saying this, I find. Yeah. Uh, well, we yeah. should just let God decide. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. Which I often think is like, please don't make me make this decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I think they they approach the church councils this way. Like a, a lot of emperors do not want theological controversies. Now, you know, Byzantium probably has the opposite reputation of emperors who are always sort of meddling in the church and all of that. But for most emperors, this was, this was trouble. Uh, and sometimes these controversies will, will just appear and the bishops will be fighting and fighting and fighting and the emperor has to do something, but they don't want to take sides because if you take sides, then you make enemies. Mm -hmm. And so they try to find these ways to have the matter resolve itself. And often they hope that a church council will do that. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, so we're not going to get involved. Yeah. Like, let the, you know, Holy Spirit figure it out, whatever. Well, and of course, it, yeah, it doesn't often work. Yeah. yeah. So in, in our project, we called uh, that process uh, put of taking a decision or procrastinating a decision making yes. process. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, also a pattern that can be found in modern times. But oh, yes. This is the height and, and the yeah, so It's, so, <laughs> it's very, uh, very common practice of politicians. Yeah? I confess I do that sometimes as department yeah. chair. To sleep one or two nights and, and yeah, so yes, this is also yes. the same. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yes, I have <laughs> actually found that many sort of short-term problems, especially you know, disputes and things like this or uncertainties, mm. will solve themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, people will talk and they'll figure it out or, you know, the person whose email is missing will send it later and something like that. And if you wait a couple of days, yeah, often it just goes away by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to know which ones you can let, you can procrastinate on and which ones you have to deal with right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So once a decision has been made, how is it sold to important constituencies? So what kind of media do the emperors have? Uh, to disseminate and justify um, their uh, their decisions, and are there like the specific kinds of rituals or performances for for these kinds of decisions? What have you found? So this uh, 
performative aspect of decision making is also an interesting field. And uh, allow me to read a sequence uh, from Michael Psellos in his uh, 14 Byzantine rulers. And uh, there he describes uh, Isakios Komnenos, um, who consults persons and then he presents the result. Um, so, quote, for instance, where a verdict had to be pronounced, he would not take the initiative himself, but refer the matter to his judges. And when they decided the case, he used to support a majority, and only then would he take the lead and record his vote, all the time pretending that his own judgment had not been influenced by the others. To avoid any mistake in legal phraseology, he left that to his juniors, but invariably, he added something which he said should have been included in the documents or else erased something on the ground that it was superfluous." End of quote. So here we see an emperor who mm. performs, well, he wants to be an expert, but he wants to be sure that uh, uh, the decision or well, the, the documents are correct. And then he adds a tiny little thing. Yes. Uh, and to say that uh, I, 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 I discovered a mistake or I added something. And then he is, is the, he makes a great performance because uh, he, he, yeah, it's, it's a very nice uh, piece of performance. And you find um, some similar uh, passages in, in Michael Psenos. And, and, and this, is, this is performance in a real sense. So the, the, the politician, he wants to present himself as a master of, uh, uh, knowledge and 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 also a, 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 um, a, um, an expert in in, uh, in in law here, for instance. Yeah, it's, it's a very nice piece. And, and it's and really this, great this, that you. This, this, uh, I I didn't know you were going to bring up that passage. Um, so I know exactly that type of person. <laughs> um, and so sometimes, so in the university administration, again, like the, the small domain of managerial culture that I know. Mm -hmm. And occasionally you will have people in the upper administration who, who behave exactly like that. That like you do all the work, but they then like to come in and sort of to tinker a little bit with this and make a change here and make a change there, just so that they, they can be seen to be actively engaged and whatever. Yeah. And I learned over the years to make very strategic mistakes in the documents that I sent <laughs> to kind of guide them toward here. You can fix this mm -hmm. so that they don't start getting ideas about like the essential things. <laughs> so yeah, eh, sorry. Um, yeah, maybe I should, maybe I'll delete that from the pod. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, talking about your manager. Mm -hmm. Talking about performance, uh, a very nice, uh, you find very nice uh, performative uh, acts of uh, making their yeah, decisions and voting persons, for instance, in Tipica, because abbots mm -hmm. and abbesses have been voted by um, drawing the lot. And, and this is a very performative act. It's uh, described in various Tipica, so, so uh, charters that describe the organization of monasteries. Um, and um, uh, so may I, I explain it a little bit? Yeah. Um, so um, a convent needs a new abbot or abbess and um, uh, three persons have to be found. So there's a, a pre-selection of uh, persons who are capable for that position. And um, the names uh, are written down on um, sheets of paper or parchment, and then they were placed uh, in an urn or in a place in, in a church. And uh, then uh, the, the gathered community uh, kept praying the whole night, for instance, and in the morning, uh, a person took one of uh, the sheets of paper and uh, the name of uh, the uh, person who was voted by divine inspiration, uh, is read to the public. And this is a highly performative act uh, because there's a community, they are praying together and they are expecting the, um, uh, exp uh, the, the, the result of that uh, process that takes a lot of hours and a lot of prayers and it's, it's uh, mm. really happening, so to say. And, and you find this yeah, in, in various typical, as I've mentioned, for instance. Yeah. 
that's interesting. That's like the ancient Athenian democracy appointed many of its magistrates mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I now remember, do, do you know this, um, the council at Adramition that um, Andronicus II, Padre Logos, um, so this is to resolve the Ars, um, uh, the schism, um, the Arsenia, the Arsenia schism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the two sides agreed to put uh, a manifesto stating their position into a fire, and whichever one survived would no, whichever one was burned, that group would agree to you know mm -hmm. join the other group and whatever. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the Arseniites document burned, and they didn't agree to join the other. Group. <laughs> So it, it didn't end there. Yeah, but that's another case of like, just let God sort of decide. And this um, is a link to the supernatural. This is also yeah. important to include uh, the supernatural in the decision-making process. And yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. is you know, sometimes recorded as well. Yeah. Okay, so under what circumstances would the emperors delegate major decisions to subordinates? Or what are the advantages and disadvantages of delegating uh, authority? On the one hand, uh, delegating uh, has, the has the advantage that uh, you, yeah, you cannot uh, provide solutions for every uh, thing or every matter in your empire. And uh, there's a need to delegate uh, certain uh, decisions to uh, subordinates. But the danger is or the disadvantage is that you also lose control about some processes mm -hmm. if you delegate uh, decision making processes or yeah, um, solutions of problems to other uh, persons. Uh, and uh, good emperors were aware of that problem. And, and, um, and this is also the tricky, one of the tricky points to, to, to be an emperor. Yeah? You have always to control your subordinates and you have always to have a group that you can trust uh, of your subordinates or your, your, your advisors. And, and this is, uh, I think, one of the uh, most problematic and uh, dangerous fields of uh, uh, Byzantine emperorship. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are regimes which are, in a certain sense, all delegation. So when there's a child emperor, for example, uh, like for, right, for many years, like yeah, this, the second and so on. This is this is another issue. It's 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 a it's a, yeah, a, yeah. a big problem for for uh, 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 um, the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, we have several uh, periods with such child emperors or with with um, 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 what's in regions regencies Reg regions regencies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so yeah. Is, um, and at the opposite extreme, you have these extreme micromanager emperors who want to control mm -hmm. everything. And mm -hmm. I mean, Justinian mm -hmm. is an example. Like he wants to mm -hmm. know every, the yeah, price yeah, of vegetables yeah. and yeah, 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 yeah. But, but yeah. Justinian was also very good at delegating too. I uh, like, yeah. he was, he was both a micromanager and very capable of identifying talented people, regardless mm -hmm. of their social class, mm -hmm. right. For his generals and John the Cappadocian, his wife, Theodora, like he just picked the people he wanted and didn't care what their background was. And he gave them quite a bit of power to, to make decisions. So he's an odd case that combines both of those things. I mean, it's, it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we're getting almost out of time in the um, talking about decision making. I also want to talk a little bit about the Byzantine review um, that you've started uh, but to, to wrap up uh, our discussion of decision making, I, I want to convey to the audience, first of all, how important this topic is in, one follow, in the following sense, that a great deal of our historical texts from Byzantium are essentially second guessing uh, imperial decisions, right? So insofar as the imperial history is the result of all of these decisions sort of compounded over time, our texts are most of the time they're sort of reflecting back on whether this decision was good or bad with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and sometimes there are intense debates about um, a, a particular decision that an emperor made. Uh, which ones stand out to you? Like, so which imperial decisions in, in the whole course of Byzantine history um, led to the most intense controversy uh, or debate afterwards or blame throwing i've noted some examples here so uh, a bad decision did not happen uh, because there were rumors in the 
seventh, eighth century that the capital should be transferred to Carthago for an is Carthag by Heraclius. <laughs> it is mentioned uh, in Nikephoros in his uh, short history, but it did not happen. So this decision has not been made because why? The patriarch and the population of Constantinople were against it. Uh, uh, but there were rumors about that. Yeah, uh, But that decision has not been made. So the transformation <laughs> of, of the Byzantine Empire to uh, the western part of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yeah, good decisions you find, as I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is a problem that good decisions are not recorded that often in the sources. Um, I can want to, to mention Manuel I, Komnenos, who recalculated the Kairos, Kairos, uh, um, the, uh, the best uh, moment, opportunity. moment of the best moment for an action uh, has to be recalculated. And this term Kairos is also very prominent in the sources. So uh, decision making is also and always linked to time. Um, so you have to find uh, the correct points in uh, the continuum of time to set the decision. And, and this is uh, also discussed in, in, in the treatises and also in historical view, find sometimes uh, references to that important topic, Kairos. Um, so the right point and also the right action. Kairos uh, means both, so the, the, mm. the exact uh, date and also the um, correct action. So I'm reminded when you said about um you know, not making a certain decision, like not moving the capital from Constantinople to Carthage. <laughs> I'm reminded of a colleague who once told me, oh, this was 15 years ago. And he said, the most important decisions of my life were the women I did not marry and the jobs I did not take. <laughs> I thought, okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting approach. Uh, all right. Um, so let's turn now to uh, I guess a side project uh, that you're running. So something very new, the Byzantine Review. So can you tell us what that is and why you helped to start it? Yeah, the Byzantine Review is uh, an online journal that started uh, two years ago uh, here at Münster. And um, it's a journal that is devoted to reviews of uh, new books covering all fields of Byzantine studies. So we have art history, archeology, span philology, history, cultural history, and so forth. So we try to cover all aspects. And the idea was, or I have to tell you, the, yeah, the idea of the journal was some 15 years ago, we spoke about uh, an online journal. And in those days, it was very difficult to, to get funding for such journals because you need technicians and experts in IT mm. to uh, produce such a journal. And you know, uh, the famous Green Moore Classical Review, they started mm -hmm. in the early 90s and it's a, it was a groundbreaking uh, project. And uh, during the years, they gathered a lot of uh, reviews and also uh, they gathered uh, reviews of Byzantine books or books devoted to Byzantine studies. And uh, then a second important online journal, the, the Medieval Review also included books covering the Eastern Roman Empire. And we thought, and this was one of the, the, the main ideas of the journal, we should um, devote such a uh, journal to Byzantine studies to give Byzantine studies its own voice. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is important, I think, for, for our subject that the Byzantine Review especially addresses um, our uh, um, product so to say our, our mm -hmm. uh, research and and this is one of the main ideas uh, why we started it and um, um, yeah we have now uh, we are in the, at the end of the third year and it develops nicely I would say um, we also include uh, a short section uh, dealing with notes uh, short notices dealing with all aspects of Byzantine studies there might be more input in the next years, but it's just um, the option also to uh, to publish uh, small findings or, or um, mm. conjectures oh, or whatever in, in, in that section. But we will see how it develops. It's, it, the idea is to have uh, also a forum of, of new inventions or new findings. Sure. In that section, yeah. So, so about how many reviews are is, is the Medieval Review publishing now? I don't know, like per month or something like what's it gotten up to? We cannot compete with them at the moment. So print more classical review. I think they have no, 30 sure. to 50, 50 reviews a month. So uh, in, in 
comparing the Byzantine review with uh, comparing the Byzantine review with uh, those journals. We are a small journal. We have up to this year forty reviews. It's, yeah, maybe it uh, will increase, but uh, yeah, it's it started well, and we hope to get gather more uh, reviews. Yeah. So in my experience, these things, they snowball, right? You know, the expression mm -hmm. like an avalanche. So it starts slow and, you know, it yeah, slowly yeah, picks yeah. up. And then suddenly the change is like geometrical. Yeah. It just starts exploding. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And it would be nice if it became like a standard, you know, instrument of the field where, you know, you, you have the review of note. Um, because as you, the medieval review is really Western Europe. Yeah. They, they rarely have anything, even in late antiquity or Byzantium. Um, so it's it's great to have our own forum. So can I ask you, just as a final question here, to articulate for us again the virtues of a book review? Because I confess that sometimes I am sort of disillusioned with the genre. Mm -hmm. um, there are I have gone through phases where I just stopped writing them because I'm just not sure what we're trying to accomplish with them. I recently. Uh, took on some uh, more, especially for <clears throat> the Bryn Mawr review, because I want classicists who read that review primarily mm -hmm. to become acquainted with some of the great work that's being done in Byzantine studies in, in things that like in classics are not really done anymore, <laughs> um, but but that our field is doing very, very well, like the, the Book of Ceremonies edition that, that came out, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but I often find that book reviews are uh, just summaries of the book um, that yeah. the kind of like a, a good college yeah. student could write them or that I mean they're not they're not critical enough by critical I don't mean like hostile I just mean mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. saying something above and beyond what the book itself mm -hmm. says like what's the added value of the review and mm -hmm. I don't know I, I sometimes feel that we're not um, living up to that challenge um, but so what do you see as the main sort of contribution of book reviews to our field? Mm. What would you hope for, like in an ideal review? Um, ideal review. So the first step is you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, yeah, we are in the humanities and I think reading and also, yeah, and, and reading a book in time, this is important. Yeah, you have to read a book in three months because you're interested, you have to read it for your own research. Uh, so this is um, also a training. I think it's, this is a very basic element of writing reviews to read and read and write in time. And it always adds, uh, and I think this is, this is important because reviews also refer or they reflect opinions in the best sense. If you have authorities, for instance, I'm interested in epistolography and it's very nice to have a review by uh, a colleague who is expert in the field, yeah, and he may add some thoughts. He and and he evaluates such a publication, and and I think this is very useful also for uh, readers that are not um, uh, that experienced in the field, for instance. So that, that's, that's an important aspect. But you're right. Sometimes, yeah, there are different levels of, of reviews. So it's yeah, just yeah. Um, summaries of the book cover or. <laughs> table of contents for instance yeah uh, but sometimes um, um, reviews develop their own life because sometimes the readers or the, the reviewers they find um, aspects that are not covered in books or they add material for instance and this mm. is what I really like uh, you see uh, a reader is, is that interested in that that uh, field of research that he can also add from his own experience to that book. And, and this is, I think, a, a value. And, and um, this is why I, I like to show review, reviews, review writing. So it's, it's not so, um, uh, well, not so bad. I mean, that's good. I mean, we need people who are interested in, and yeah. committed to the genre um, because after all, the audience is very diverse. So yeah. there are, I, I guess there is a role for the review that summarizes a book because especially like for graduate students who are sometimes assigned, you know, 10 or 20 books to get through in, in a week or so, like ultimately they, they read the reviews and skim the books. Mm. And I don't know how I feel about that, but I know that it happens. Mm. And there's also a place for like a real sort of in-depth engagement with the argument. 
um, and not just uh, pushing back on the argument, but also maybe building the argument and like, well, this can be applied here too. And, you know, mm -hmm. we can do more things with the argument of this book uh, that than is in the book. Um, so, yeah, but I was, I was reminded by the, first, when you said, first of all, you have to read the book. Um, I remember um, Schopenhauer, he's, he's a philosopher I was reading in the 90s. And he has this wonderful, so he's this kind of bitter, sarcastic guy, mm -hmm. but a wonderful writer. Arthur Schopenhauer is an uh, early 19th century philosopher. And, um, and, he's, and he, he had a very low opinion of, well, basically everybody else. Um, but he's, he's listing what his book does. This is the, the, the world is mm -hmm. will and representation, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, he, uh, and he says, well, you know, you can, you can do this and you can do that. And it, you can, uh, if you don't want to read it, uh, he says, you can even use it as a coffee table uh, book to show to others uh, how sophisticated you are. Or if you don't want to read it, uh, you may review it. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right. Great. Well, so um, I encourage the audience to check out the Medieval Review. It's online. Uh, it covers uh, books written in all the languages. All the languages, yeah, yeah. This is also because Byzantine studies is a multilingual subject and uh, I'm also keen to invite uh, readers and writers in Greek and Italian, for instance. And yeah, this is also, uh, I think, an aspect of Byzantine studies that we are still multilingual or we try to keep to be multilingual. That is right. That's right. It is a field that is still very tightly integrated across very many mm. languages. And in contrast, I have to say to classics, where so Anglo-American classicists mm -hmm. have kind of, you know, can afford to, like there's such a critical mass of scholarship uh, in English that they can kind of afford sometimes to not pay too much attention to, you know, French and German and Italian and so mm -hmm. on. Um, but that, <clears throat> that doesn't happen in Byzantine studies, or at least I hope it doesn't. And, and mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that it's an international integrated mm -hmm. discipline with a sort of identity of its own. Anyway, Michael, thank you very much uh, for coming on here. I very much look forward to where this project goes and, and, and learning more about, you know, imperial decision making, or just decision making in general, like the case of the monasteries that you mentioned and so on. So it's great stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.